given to me by Woody Shaw, Sunship, Dizzy, and John Kahn, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my music heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome, everybody, inside the Brady Broadcasting Studio at 25 East Glen. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you so much for being part of the program today. And today's a special day because normally most of my interviews revolve around phone interviews, whether it's Ramblin' Jack Elliott or David Grisman or Larry Willis or Jack DeJanette or Buster Williams. But today I am honored to be joined in studio by a bluegrass legend, great singer, multi-instrumentalist, and a guy who continues to create, Peter Rowan. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks, Jake. It's good to be with you. I wanted to... Uh, ask you a little bit about um, the the festival Pickin' in the Pines in, in, in Flag, Flagstaff. Mm. Have you have you done this festival before? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Not to my recollection. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember Laurie Lewis came back from there a few years ago and gave me a t-shirt and said, these folks want to have you up there. And so finally it's come to pass. And I'm going to have my entire bluegrass band with me, uh, which is Keith Little on the five-string banjo, singing tenor. Chris Henry on the mandolin, singing tenor and baritone, and uh, Paul Knight on the bass, and the fabulous Blaine Sprouse on the fiddle. So it's it's some years of my history kind of come together to even have a bluegrass band it, itself. You know. You want? Can you talk a little bit about your history coming together? Because I I mean I know, I mean you learned under the tutelage of Bill Monroe, and now you get a chance to uh, be a mentor. These all all these cats are younger than you. Yeah, well, not everybody's that much younger than I am in the band. I guess <clears throat> Chris Henry's in his early 30s. Uh, I'm past 60s. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the bookend on, on in the band. And uh, it took me a long time to want to even be a leader. Um, I was sort of the eternal student, the eternal acolyte, the, the disciple, you know, and never felt I had learned enough. And, uh, and then suddenly... Five or six years ago, well, I mean, really, actually, it was it was the last eighteen years working with Tony Rice who forced me to be the leader of that aggregate. I mean, I was deferring to him all the time because I figured he was the most senior, musically developed person in the group. But we did this album quartet, and we had Bryn Bright and Sharon Gilchrist uh, on board, and bass and mandolin, and and for a while it uh, it was good. But you know. Uh, our probably our best album came after eight years of work instead of bef- in the beginning, uh, and that's the the kind of uh, twist of the road is that if the news is out that you're willing to tour before the record's out, you have to be careful that you don't just get out there and you know spend all your time performing without being able to develop new material. So it it you know we did two albums over over eight years. Um, Then I formed a bluegrass band uh, with Jody Stecker and Keith Little and um, made two records for Compass Records, and this last record is called Old School with an homage to Vassar Clements, who told me, Pete, you know how it was with Bill Monroe. You had to drive all night, shave in cold water, raise your hand up high and smile, and that's the rule of the old school. So we've been riding on the old school here for the past couple of years, and uh, I think next year is going to be a bluegrass year. We're going to put out a live recording. Uh, but these days, you know, record releases are, are very few and far between, and and really finding out a way to distribute it is is the key. But anyone can put a record out. It's not that hard. You can get your title on Amazon and everything. But it's still the live u- music for me. Uh, it's making those acoustic instruments sing that makes bluegrass a wonderful music, and the 
vocal harmonies, you know, interplay between the vocals and the instrumentals is, is the magic. And uh, it's, I don't find it at all anachronistic uh, to be playing straight, straight ahead bluegrass band style at this point in my life. It's, it's helping me uh, as a songwriter, really, to write very kind of direct songs, not trying to be too, you know, artsy fartsy about, you know, mysterious this or that. It's like, you know, all songwriters want to write an anthem. And I guess old school might be my, my bluegrass anthem, along with the high lonesome sound. <clears throat> the Walls of Time I did write that one with Bill Monroe. Uh, so it, it's a good period. And, and when, when we can get a festival like the, the Festival of the Pines uh, to really go for it and bring us all down there and make it worthwhile, you know, it, it means a lot to us. And we, we, it, we don't take that for granted. We really try and do our best. It's... Um and then, of course, for me, um, it just coincided that uh, we were able to schedule a concert prior to Picking in the Pines down in Sao Rita tonight mm. at the Good Shepherd Church. And, uh, you know, I, I it's it's uh, it's going to be a really organic, beautiful thing. I wanted I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, Clarence Ashley. Does that what does that name mean to you? Well, back in the 1960s, there was a record produced by a friend of mine uh, and a friend of Dave Grisman's, a man named Ralph Rinsler, who had taken it upon himself to take some high-tech portable analog <clears throat> recording equipment, which were two, two uh, Niagara's, I think they were, two Swiss uh, double-track, I think you could do, record stereo at the time, down to North Carolina, and, uh, and Ralph had discovered Doc Watson, and before Doc had decided that he wanted to be a solo artist, he was making music locally with Clarence Ashley and uh, a couple of other folks. And Ralph Rinsler went down there and recorded them all in their houses, having a jam session, and uh, that, that sort of revolutionized the sense of how we're listening to old-time music in the 60s. Because Clarence Ashley's music had first appeared on the uh, Harry Smith collection that I think was put out on Folkways. And the Harry Smith collection, Harry was an eclectic artist. He had found all these old discs, these uh, vinyl recordings of early country and blues out in Seattle in some junk shop. <laughs> and he bought them all, mm. and he made a record, a two-volume record, with wonderful liner notes and uh, very much the spirit of the 60s, a kind of like, where did this come from? What is this mysterious music? And uh, and I think Grail Marcus dubbed it the music of the old, weird America. And, uh, you know, in a way, it is. It is. All that music is weird. It's talking about a lot of things that just, you know, are archetypically... Um, and there, there are archetypes of experiences like the sick child, the hanging tree, and all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, it, even just as an artifact, it was interesting. But for young players who were <clears throat> sort of, I had one foot in a kind of rock and roll world and another foot in the blues. And I had been doing square dancing to old time music, but none of it kind of, none of it came together until, you know, I started hearing the perspective that the Harry Smith collection gave uh, the listener in hearing old-time American music that was recorded in the 1920s and the 30s. And that and the wonderful music recorded by Alan Lomax, live church singing in the, in the churches of the South during the 1950s. And, Oh, cowboy songs recorded in the 40s by his father out in Texas. And I started hearing this stuff, and it just blew my mind because I knew that this was, well, maybe had begun and ended in that moment with those people. And so, you know, they say country music is came from the Carter family, but the Carter family came from somewhere, too. You know, and they used to go around, uh, A.P. Carter would go around to the black communities and learn their music and then translated it into what we call the early Carter family sound. 
And even Jimmy Rogers, the great icon, the blue yodeler from Mississippi, his first band was Jimmy Rogers and his Hawaiian entertainers. Because the only people that were around were these Hawaiian slide guitar players and uke players mm. that had come over and played uh, the like the World's Fair in St. Louis and the Chicago World's Fair. And the Hawaiian Pavilion was very popular, and they stayed for a while in the States, Laney McIntyre, and all those guys all played with Jimmy Rogers, so country music was really kind of trans-Pacific. You know, it was country and Western and Eastern. <laughs> and, um, you know, there is still a great affinity uh, in that wonderful interplay between acoustic music and voices. Uh, and I, uh, part of my interest has been to follow that thread, you know, to follow it all the way through my songwriting. Basically, I I write m pretty much all the songs that we do and that I record. Just made that commitment a long time ago that it had to be m creative enough to spark my interest in the, uh, my worldview. You know, I did a solo album called Dust Bowl Children. It was just myself and guitar produced by Jerry Douglas. Amazing to have the world, one of the world's best dobro players not play a note on the record, <laughs> but just tell me when I was doing it right. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, you know, it, it goes in cycles. I think I'm coming around through the bluegrass now back to in kind of a simpler, rootsier approach. You know, I wanted to ask you chronologically about um, the... Uh, the situation with when you actually joined Bill, Bill Monroe's band, mm -hmm. uh, Del McCurry was was leaving the band, and then and then and then also when did Vassar come into the band? If he did, when you well, were there? Well, no, uh, I have to go back a little bit on that because it uh, it was still in the early fifties when Vassar Clement, as a teenager, uh, was apprenticing to Chubby Wise, the fiddle player that would, had been in Bill's band for such a long time and kind of defined that smooth bluesy fiddling that bluegrass had become known for and the young Jimmy Martin was auditioning for guitar and Vassar Clemens told me that he would he, he used to watch or at a was witness to uh, Chubby Wise teaching Jimmy Martin how to use a flat pick at Bill's request uh, a little known fact about Chubby Wise was although he was the great fiddler he didn't sing, and so when the Bluegrass Quartet with Lester Flatt, Earl Scruggs, Cedric Rainwater, and Bill Monroe stood around and sang, you can see pictures, there's Bill playing the mandolin, and off to the side is this other guy playing guitar, and that's Chubby Wise playing guitar during the gospel tunes. Wow. So the gospel tunes had a certain verve to them, kind of excitement to them, that was different than the Bluegrass Boys as a band. And they called it, the Bill called it uh, the Bluegrass Quartet, Bluegrass Boy Quartet, maybe. And so Chubby had uh, caught Bill's ear with his, you know, his pizzicato violin technique turned into what they call a straight pick, which is a flat piece of plastic or tortoise shell. So a straight picking became the hallmark of bluegrass guitar after Jimmy Martin, because before that it was all a thumb picking, it was all a kind of a classical lick. We pull with your forefinger and strum across with your your bass. And they still do that in Hawaiian music today. Uh, ukulele players, slack key players kind of do that technique. And, uh, you know, people like Merle Travis and Chet Atkins had the finger-picking style going along, coming in from over in uh, Bristol and uh, Knoxville area. But Bill's music came from Kentucky, and I don't know why, but he wanted that flat-picking sound. So Vassar Clemens, as a 16-year-old uh, apprentice fiddler to Chubby Wise, watched Chubby teach Jimmy Martin to use a flat-pick, and then Chubby left the band after him. He was there the longest of the original Bluegrass Boys. Mm. And Vassar recorded, uh, he was the, you know, the... the linchpin of, of the new Bill Monroe sound with Jimmy Martin. They recorded Uncle Penn. They recorded the new Mule Skinner Blues. He re recut Footprints in the Snow. You know, he recut re some of his hits. 
And uh, Vassar led the charge. And I guess that went on through hmm, probably five or six years up until like the early 60s when Elvis had changed the face of country music and bluegrass was no longer a com competitor because it didn't change its sound. Bluegrass was now a, sort of an anachronistic, a historical sound that had, had no home really. But, mm. but, but let us not forget, Bill Monroe was still a star on the Grand Ole Opry. And so were the Osborne brothers, and so were Jim and Jesse McReynolds. There were three bluegrass bands on the Opry right there, um, and Flat and Scruggs. Uh, Jim, Jimmy Martin was the only one who didn't get the Opry gig, and that was pretty controversial among the inner workings of bluegrass because Bill Monroe felt that he had taught all these people how to play, and he, and he was competitive enough not to want to be, to be, you know, he not wanted to be overshadowed by his students, basically, you know. But, of course, bluegrass had become a style, and Bill Monroe didn't really understand that. He still felt it was my music. He, he called it my music. And Sonny Osborne had been in his band, Earl Scruggs, and, and Lester Flatt had been in his band, and there they all were out there doing the thing on the stage because they had been in Bill's band. Mm -hmm. And they had the, and so bluegrass was very, very popular, it had the Opry shows had it, at least as much bluegrass as it did electric country music, and that's even like through the fifties into the sixties. Um, Del McCurry had left the band after a year. Um, what kind of country music was being played at the Opry's at that time? Oh well, well the, the Opry, you know, reflected a very older taste. You know, it was Roy Acuff, uh, the Willis Brothers, mm -hmm. which was like a an accordion based. Accordion, fiddle, guitar, uh, cowboy trio, you know, stuff that was from really an earlier era. M but then there was Porter Wagoner and Marty Robbins. And I mean, those guys used to have the, the great uh, kind of sing-offs. You know, m uh, Porter would get out there and he'd milk the crowd and, and get them going. And then, then of course, uh, here would come... Uh, I, I was listening. I'm following everything. It, it I, was I, the I, '60s, man. Yeah, <laughs> Marty Robbins, <laughs> and, and so <laughs> Marty would come out, and he'd and he'd top Porter, and then Porter would come out, and he'd just wow him again uh. with Dolly or something, and then. But really, the real winner was, uh, in a way, really was Marty Robbins. His versions of uh, El Paso, and and uh, he made a Hawaiian record made two records of Hawaiian music with Jerry Bird playing steel. The thing about Marty was he was from Arizona, <laughs> and he knew Spanish music, and he knew Hawaiian music, and so he brought a wonderful, I would say, mellifluous, very open vocal, kind of warm and engaging vocal. You know, he wasn't trying to play the country music game and, and put a lot of twang in there, you know. And country music at the time had a, had some variety. But there's Bill Monroe, and he's still playing. And uh, after a tour or two, Del McCurry left, I think, probably in 60, 61. Bill Monroe uh, was touring the East Coast, and, and Bill Keith was still in the band. And Bill Keith left the band because Bill Monroe had accepted a date on Hootenanny. And the show Hootenanny had blackballed Pete Seeger as a communist agitator from the days when he hung out with Woody Guthrie and the, and the Weavers. And so that's why Bill Keith left the band with all its attendant uh, responsibilities of being a bluegrass boy. He left the band because Bill Monroe was going to play Hootenanny and Bill Keith couldn't in all conscience I mean, play Hootenanny who had blackballed PC. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, that's Standing amazing. above the, you know. <clears throat> so... Your first... Um, and Monroe came up to New England, and Keith uh, called me and said, we need to put together a band for Bill Monroe. Do you want to play guitar? And I said, yeah. Yeah, so and Bill said, you ought to come to Nashville, boy. I can hip you. <laughs> the, the, um, the first time you met Vassar Clemens was when? Okay, so while I was a bluegrass boy, we used to go down to Louisiana, and you know, we're talking... 63, 65, 66, and then early seven, the 67 March, I was gone. But 
while I was living in Nashville, we would get in the old bus and drive down to play the Louisiana Grand Old Opry. It was nothing of the sort. It was just a name that, you know, nobody cared about copyrights. Nothing was being televised. You know, you want to use that name, you know. Go ahead. Have your own backyard Grand Old <laughs> Opry, you know. And we'd stay down there with a guy named Rule Yarbrough who had played with Bill on and off through the years. And it was just customary to play the gig and drive back, especially when you drive back to Nashville eight hours, especially when you've got a bunch of 20-year-olds and, you know, you, you make the 20-year-olds work and you rest, you know. And uh, so we'd drive in the bus and we stopped at Rule's house and while we're having, quote, breakfast at three in the morning, <laughs> um, Rule put on the tape deck, you know, Turned the the old wall and sack or a little. I don't think we even had any Japanese equipment at that time. Sure. It was just starting to come out, and you know, push that central central button, and your little seven and a half speed tape would play. And here was this New Year's Eve party that had been taped, and Vassar Clemens, you know, probably. Mostly retired off the road, away from the life, you know, the life of the road, would come up to Rules Place every New Year's and play at the party, picking party. And some of the best music I've ever heard. And I never forgot it. And five years later, after I'd already been through, you know, I left Bill Monroe in 67 and formed Earth Opera with David Grisman. And then we did Mule Skinner for Warner Brothers. And then we did C Train, two albums for Capitol Records. That was all within five years of leaving the Bluegrass Boys. And as one endearing fan told me at Merle Fest last year, Pete, you're my dad's hero. You quit Bill Monroe to join Jerry Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> That's, the, 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 That's the urban myth. <laughs> yeah, because because there was a lot. It's right. It's interesting. There's you, you, you caught fire with like quite a few things in between. Ewell Skinner... Was so Clem. So that was the first time you met well, Vassar. Well, I didn't meet Vassar on that trip. We were talking still back in the Bill Monroe time, sixty four, sixty five. So five years later, after all this rock and roll, and I was out in California. I'd left C Train to kind of rejoin forces uh, in just the most personal way with my brothers, and Dave Grisman had been producing them for, for Columbia Records. And Jerry Garcia lived up the hill, and I would just, you know, wake up in the morning, shiftless hippie life, and not even put shoes on, just kind of walk through the sand dunes with my guitar to David's house and to wake him up, and we'd have a little refreshment to kind of wake ourselves up, and we'd pick, and, you know, and we'd already played earth opera, you know, we'd already done all that, so there was, we weren't exploring new ground if we played any of that material, it was more sentimental, but so we were just picking bluegrass mostly, you know, just coming back to those roots and one day he said you know you know very shortly after we were starting to get together he said you know garcia lives up the hill he likes to pick and i said let's go man so he called up there and i had met jerry on one of my west coast trips before and he's a super nice guy and we went up to his house there was a sign over at over the entrance said sans souci which i think means no problem and uh, we walked into his yard, and there was Spud Boy playing the five string. He met us playing. He came out of the house playing, and it was a it was a joyful get together. And we rehearsed and played without playing a live gig for a couple of months. And then we had John Hartford play with us. Richard Green played with us, and we played uh, some local places around with those guys playing the fiddle part. And we knew we needed a fiddler. Did a few gigs, uh, just the four of us too. John Conn on bass. The, uh, the, so because well they booked a tour <clears throat> Sam Cutler who had been at Altamont with the Rolling Stones and then just kind of bailed on everything because of the chaos mm -hmm. was living around that area and he the Grateful Dead hired him to, to do bookings and things for him he was a very, very kind of proactive guy or you could say aggressive, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, so Sam, he said, well, we've got you some gigs, boys. You want to go on the road? And we're like, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Sure. You know, you know. I mean, we're starting to make money playing bluegrass, which is a novelty enough in itself. That's because of Jerry's popularity, playing all the local clubs. And, and it, you know, the, oh, you would talk about the aura of that time. There certainly was an aura of sort of weird magic, you know. 
Uh, were, not, you, were you uh, were you conscious? Like, only looking back, is it clear now, or were you conscious of it at that time, of that weird magic? Oh yeah, it, totally. Sort of conscious of something, but didn't know what it was exactly. Right. But it felt everything was weird. <laughs> weird, man. <laughs> weird. <laughs> yeah, it's good. But that weird was weird meant good in those right. days. Weird meant hey, far out, you know. Even Bill Monroe had a '60s expression. He'd sit there and he'd drum his fingertips on the countertop. He go, and he go, lotty lotty, lotty lotty. That that was Bill's sixties. That was as far thing. as he got. Well, I mean, that, he heard us call doing things like Phew, and weird and far out. Yeah, and, right. And his his thing his take was lotty lotty. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to go on the road, and we didn't have a fiddler, and we were going to play Boston. And I I looked I remembered in my wallet I still had Rules number because Vassar had I mean. I had to know how to reach faster. So I t- took Rule's number out of the out of my little beat up wallet and I called him down in Alabama and I said, How can I reach Vassar? And he said, Well, you know, he doesn't travel much, but and Vassar was still pretty young, you know, just the life. I think his wife had tried to keep him from getting too involved on the road. The road'll eat you up. Just eat you up, kill you, in a, in many ways. And uh <laughs> so I called Vassar and I said, hey, man, Peter Rowe. He said, well, Pete, how are you, man? You've been doing good work. And I'm like, well, but we think of you a lot. Um, playing with uh, Dave Grisman and Jerry Garcia. Jerry who? Yeah, Jerry Garcia. He's a banjo player. He's got a band out here called the Grateful Dead. The what? <laughs> you know? I said, you want to do Where some... Where was he living? Right he there? was in Alabama, uh, Florida. Florida. He was in Florida. Florida yeah. I said, you want to... Come up and play some dates with us in New England. He said, "Dad, blame me. I'd, I'd love to do that. Bluegrass, yeah, with straight grass. I like it a lot. Uh, I, I, you know, drums and all that. You know, it's 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 tiring after a while." And I said, "Well, this is going to be just straight bluegrass." And um, so we flew to Boston, and he flew in that same day, and that was uh, that was when we were all had all our bags off the off the carousel and the carousel was still going around there was this big giant red samsonite <laughs> cherry red bag still going around i said is that is that yours and, and uh, david said no i got mine and jerry come, walks over and says i'll take big red <laughs> he reaches over and he grabs the red samsonite bag and it turned out to be Surprise, surprise. Uh, contraband, seized contraband that had found its way through the border people and immigration and dr- tobacco and firearms people. It, it had traded hands several times until it arrived in Harvard University in the hands of some law school students that knew the, the inner workings of the... Uh, of the uh, what do you call it? I don't know what you call it, but it 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 turned out to be the most amazing sort of smokable substance that we, I think we ever found. And I mean, it, and it was and it was on the on the. It was just going around and around in the big red bag. And, and it, I guess what had happened is you know the there had been an arrangement made, and and uh, and half the law students at Harvard were Grateful Dead fans anyway. So nobody was trying to like you know spy on Jerry. See who was going to pick it up and then no, nail, you know? no. It was just kind of we all stood around for a minute and and kind of looked at each other and 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 Jerry just sort of went, "I'll take big red." <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I want to go back for a minute because um, we and didn't, so we were all there. Yeah, Vassar was there, and then we we started touring at that point. Yeah, um, because we didn't listen to this part of the interview yet with 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 David, but he he says that with Olden in the way. Uh, that Richard Green did not want to, didn't go, he didn't want to go on tour. He yeah, we, we offered Richard the job. We offered Richard the job, and Richard said, I'm doing my own thing. He had a band called, uh, a project called The Zone. I'm still, I'm still looking for, there's one, he put out one album with one, that. Yeah. I got to find that album. It's very hard to find. But the point is that Green turned it down, 
and then David said, uh, uh, he said, you know, I, I mean, you obviously had his, they just said, call the old boy up, call up Vassar. And he said, Jerry called him, but you called him. Mm -hmm. You called Ra mm -hmm. uh, Raul, uh, and then. I would call Rua, I forget who might have talked to Jerry first, I don't know. I mean, I talked to Vassar, but, you know. And then. Introductions it, were made. And then, um, can you just talk about, um, like what Vassar brought to the what you guys were doing. Well, first of all, I want to go back for a second because because I, this is what I really wanted to get into. The in Southern California, um, there was uh, you had the Maharishi Maharishi Yogi and a lot of tra transcendental meditation going on. Um, and then I just wanted you to talk about the allure, if there was any, if you could talk about Stinson Beach, and what made that play. How did it wind up that that that's where people like yourself and the dog and and, and Garcia gravitated to what was going on. I mean, aside from it being a, uh, I think you said shiftless hippie lifestyle. Um, <laughs> I mean, oh, I, I don't think that you guys were you guys weren't practicing. Uh, you know, you I don't know if you had a guru at that time or not. But 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 what was it about Stinson, Stinson Beach that that there was a mystique there? Well, it was a, at that time it was just a little beach town. It was a little country town. Rents were cheap, hundred bucks a month, and get you a nice place. And um, we just gravitated there. Uh, Stinson wasn't known as like a spiritual capital of, or anything. In fact, it was the myth of the time was that when the earthquake comes, it's going to break off at Stinson Beach, <laughs> and we're going to go out to sea. <laughs> that was the story of Stinson mystical. Beach. Yeah, right. you know, but, but really wonderful to be by the water for three years. Uh, but, you know, going over the hill became more and more of a, you know, you're away from you know, all the traffic and all the busyness over the hill, which is probably negligible at the time compared to now. And you're in this sort of utopic kind of place with this kind of... St you're very close to the elements. You know, you've got the... You've got the... the it, a bird fly zone, you know. You've got all kinds of migrating birds coming through there. And you you have the changes in the weather. This you like... It, that part of the coast didn't have a fog bank like further up in Tomales Bay, they got a fog bank. And so Stinson would have these like incredibly sparkling days. Mm. My two brothers had moved there with David Grisman and worked on a record for Columbia Records. And coincidentally, Jerry Garcia lived there. And I, it was just sort of where you go. It's the end of the trail. There was nothing. There was a 7-Eleven and Ed Superett and a post office. And, and a kind of live and let live mm -hmm. attitude. And then... It's, uh, I remember the day that the the smugglers from Texas came down my street in their pickup trucks and could we put this in your house until we can move it? And I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> not not today. <laughs> but it became an encampment. My mm -hmm. street became an encampment, but it was a, it had not, not so much to do with music itself as with the, the migrating people from Texas who wanted to where outlaws wanted to live someplace where they had low visibility, you know, and still dress like cool cowboys and things the uh because we we ended the, the last interview we did um and now it's kind of crystallizing with mule skinner uh when you cut those albums uh you who, how did you decide on john Kahn to do the bass work on that well originally it was the bass player for uh canned heat Oh, it was Larry Taylor? Larry Taylor. Larry Taylor? Mm -hmm. Larry Taylor is on some of those tracks. Oh, Larry Taylor's on the Mule Skinner track? Yeah. I'm obsessed with Larry Taylor because he did some work with Shaky Jake, the harmonica player. Well, mind blowing. The thing about it was wow. that, wow. to speak, you know, candidly about mm -hmm. it, we had already started playing with John Kahn and Jerry Garcia, me and David, and we were getting something that we thought was very close to what we're looking for in bluegrass. And to, to to do Mule Skinner and have Larry, he was hired for the session, I think, by Richard and Clarence White. It was kind of like Larry had a, a broader uh, beat that was centered around blues and rock. And because David and I were heading more deeper into the bluegrass uh, sense of, of syncopation, there was a little bit of a conflict there. And... Um, Candidly, it was David who said, you know, I we can't do this, you know. And so we we let Larry go and brought John Kahn in, whose sense of humor and 
you know, bass playing was was more of what we were already playing with John. I mean, that's one of those conflicts when you start playing with two bands and two members are in both bands. So, you know, so we brought in something that weighed it towards the field we were working on already, which was an acoustic bass. Right. But there's still some of Larry's stuff in there. There's a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit Mm -hmm. on the... Yeah. Okay, because I have have the reissue on... Ridge Runner. No, I have the uh, reissue of all you guys with your mugs on on the, and then there's one that there's a horse on. I but, but okay, it, the horse was the original album cover, and that's probably John Delgado's re- release. The Ridge Runner was the black cover with all the photos. I wrote the liner notes for that one. It, you yeah. did, I, I got Slim a great Richie, great yeah. picture of you on there. The uh, but you're saying that ta- so Taylor was never credited, but there's some stuff on there. I don't know if he was credited. Because the, the two cats that are credited are John Guerin, who was a you know was an incredible drummer, and 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 Con on bass. Well, then they must have just not used any of Larry's stuff. But I remember hearing it during the mixes, and we were a being the parts, and you know there wasn't really that much of a difference. I, I, they both him and Con very just able to lock that groove. You know, I mean if that's what you were looking for. I'm not a musician, but you say Larry was maybe moving towards the electric blues and John you were going more for bluegrass it, the electric blues thing was a little too bluesy I mean too a little too groovy groovy you know what I mean yes you know yes whereas the bluegrass thing it was like just dead simple drop drop the beat right in there and just don't don't elaborate don't do a lot of um, you know secondary notes to to you know just be rootsy. Just be rootsy. Don't be funky. Just be. Don't. Right. Yeah. Because there's a difference between funk and kind of an acoustic thing. Um, you can you talk about uh, those those show those East Coast shows? A lot of them are recorded from Capitol Theater in Passaic and in Boston. That you went with Vassar. Uh, what was it like to play with Vassar, especially because you and Jerry and... Well, you know, just, just stand around in a circle playing and we're all smiling and looking at each other going, yeah, uh-huh, this uh-huh. is it. The thing is that Vassar was so facile, is so, you know, so able to adapt to anything in these tunes like Midnight Moonlight. He, he loved it. There was Here was a bluegrass tune with new chord changes, you know, and, and new movement within the song and an extended solo where you could you could just play forever you know what I mean it's like we we jumped to the middle section of that song which was the solo section and I had written it in based on an Otis Redding chord change that from A we're going to play in C and then go back to A and although Grisman once tortured me by saying that man it's only two chords you know <laughs> it's like yeah okay but it's two chords the thing is, it was the first thing in bluegrass that where there was ever any kind of a jam session in the middle of a song. And, I mean, bluegrass is jammy enough. You know, Bill Monroe told me, he said, Pete, don't go too far out on a limb. There's enough flowers out there already. <laughs> you know, but so by putting that th- this sort of sequence, like a really just chords that I, that I picked up from Otis Redding or Carl Perkins, but no, it was Otis, yeah. Yeah, you 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 work between A and C, two different keys, and nobody had ever had that opportunity in bluegrass to kind of just play out the changes, you know. It was very simple, you know. It wasn't like j- jazz. It wasn't meant to be like jazz. And Vassar just took off, <laughs> you know. He said, "Ah, Dad, blame it. I've been waiting all this time for this." <laughs> you know. He said, "He said this is what I want to do." And so he, for the next, you know, and I thought it was a much longer, but really only for the next year and a half he came out, flew out all the time, you know, and uh, and we played gigs up and down the West Coast and uh, we never toured again. Oh, we went to, yeah, that was the same tour. We went to Virginia from Boston and stuff. But the problem was that all these festivals are outdoors and Jerry had bad asthma. <laughs> and he had hay fever and, you know, the, there's a lot of dust at a bluegrass festival. And uh, there were more dates being booked. I mean, we could have kept going, but it it just, Jerry didn't, it, he didn't dig it. It was too, you know, I mean, the the dead itself was was enough to deal with in terms of touring, you know, all those people. <coughs> and um, 
and logistics and how to make that work, and then to have another band that's going to be just like that, it didn't appeal to him. He wanted Olden in the Way to be fun. Didn't want it to become work. And uh, so we, because we were still young in our 20s, you know, uh, the kind of motivation and excitement kind of went on for another year and a half, two years, and then just sort of disappeared. And all the old jokes took on a sinister meaning, you know. We used to call each other, you know, you know, melon, hey, melon head, you know, and laugh and, you know, smoke. And, you know, and after a while, melon head became sinister. It became like, am I not pleasing you, buddy? <laughs> you know, hey, melon. <laughs> you know, it, it just went bad. It went bad. It I don't know why. And I, it may have been the drugs, you know. It may have been that the Grateful Dead was, was now beginning to consume Jerry because he left his home after that. In fact, he left uh, Mountain Girl and the kids while we were still playing with him. And, and Mountain Girl was as close to us as Jerry was, you know, and still is. I mean, she is a very candid person, and she was worried. She said, ah, I don't know what Garcia is doing. Why? He, you know, he, now he's living over the hill, closer to the office, Closer to the Grateful Dead thing. Well, I got to rehearse, so I better live close by. And and it, you know, these little changes you make, you know, uh, little changes, and and you may not know what they are. And at one point, David expressed his dissatisfaction and wanted to quit the band. And Jerry talked to me and said, "I want to keep going." And that was an offer for me to become the leader, but I wasn't ready to become the leader of Old and In the Way. To my great eh, regret, actually, you know. Uh, John, uh, I got a call from uh, a friend of mine on the East Coast said, you know, if Grisman ever leaves the band, there's this kid, Ricky Skaggs, who could really fill his shoes. And, you know, it was beyond my scope of, of thinking. I should have been much more broad-minded and said, yeah, okay, this is a national band, and Jerry's into it, and Jerry wants to play. So it's up to me to put the band together now. It wouldn't have been hard. You know, Vassar was still into it. It just was mm, timing, you know. It was timing, and, and I was actually enjoying being a bit of a goofball with my brothers, you know. Uh, and I know Jerry felt it. I let him down. I, he, he expressed it a few times. Not pleasantly, either. He uh, he was becoming a little bit more, uh, like, it's just interesting because the, the time that... Uh, you guys made that. How did that album come off the ground? I mean, that was just through round. That was through round records. Yeah, it went to round, then it went to rounder. Oh no, it went to Sugar Hill, and then it went to Ryko Disc. It's out there still somewhere. But I guess you you said that Jerry was actually be, because of the hay fever was beginning to burn out. But you're saying he was still into it though. Well, he was into it, but Olden in the Way could not become a fe bluegrass festival type band and tour with these conditions, which were would 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 make Jerry vulnerable to, you know, the dust thing was just on that particular tour, but it was indicative of how he needed to be protected. You know, even with the Grateful Dead, he'd just stay in his hotel room till it came time to, to go on stage, and he would just, he never, want, didn't want to do interviews, didn't want to socialize, you know, and it be, his habit became what finally just brought him down, you know. The iner inertia became sort of inert in, in physically and mentally never, but in physically. And Mountain Girl told me, you know, he said, she said that... Uh, you know, even though she's not with Jerry at that point, she she said, you know, it's very important for Garcia to have have a, this bluegrass band. And I said, well, what can I do? You know, the half the band quit. <laughs> she said, can you find other people? And I said, I, you know, bluegrass to me was not that much of a crusade at the time. But what I didn't realize was how much it meant for Jerry to have an outlet that he wasn't responsible for that could provide him some happiness, you know? And then without anything, everybody went in their own directions, you know? Con John Conn stayed with Jerry till the very end, you know? And, f you know, also David was really pissed off because the Grateful Dead never paid us the royalties they owed us because they used that money for their movie, 
and went to Egypt or something. You know oh, what I mean? It yeah. was like oh. part of part of it was you know not. I mean, I love Jerry, but mm-hmm. part of it was dealing with this thing that he was trapped in, which was this phantom ship called the Grateful Dead. And you know, there it was, always just off the coast, always <laughs> sending longboats in to haul Jerry back out. And said, but, but, but wait, wait, we're playing music. No, right. he's got to go with the Grateful Dead. Right. You know, actually, that that was the the biggest deterrent to me to want to be further involved in kind of being the point man for a new version of Olden in the Way. And what would we call it? Would we call it Olden in the Way? So it it, it was good what we had because. We were, in a way, Grisman and I were always like, wanted to thumb our noses at the record business and just say, ha, see, good music will win. And for a while it did. For a while, good music really had the day. Yeah, no, it's true. They, uh, um, Jerry just wanted to be, he wanted to be an accompanist and have, he didn't want to have to be responsible for getting 20,000 people off every night. He just wanted to be part of a group that where the music felt good, you know? Right. Right, and I guess I was in my own trajectory towards, you know, trying to find my way, you know. You, you, you know, even though the plateau of Old in the Way was super, you know, it was where my songwriting was presented in, in bluegrass, as bluegrass, and Land of the Navajo, Panama Red, Midnight Moonlight, and L.A. Cowboy, and all those songs I had written that were rejected by the establishment on the East Coast were gobbled up by the new writers of the Purple Sage and members of the Grateful Dead and everybody. Um, I just did a record uh, that's finally come out after about six or seven years called Dharma Blues on Omnivore Records. And the producer, John Shalou, used to book the club McCabe's in L.A., so he, he saw me go through changes through the years. And uh, the bass player on the project Dharma Blues is Jack Cassidy, and in the film, there's a film. Uh, I, you know, I can give you a copy of this film. It's called uh, The Tao of Bluegrass. Wow. It's a biography of me, and it features a lot of that, the recording sessions from Dharma Blues seven years ago. And there's an interview with Jack Cassidy where I guess the question was, so what did, what did Peter bring when he came to the West Coast? And he just starts talking and saying, well, he got together with Jerry and all of a sudden there was a string band happening in the Bay Area that hadn't happened in a long time because the early string bands like Mother McCree's Jug Stompers and, and you know, those pre- precursors to the the Grateful Dead and the other name of them, what were they called? The, not the vampires, but... Um, the Warlocks. Know, the Warlocks. Before there was the electric version of Jerry's expression... It was all acoustic, you know, and then there was this sec- immediate success of touring up and down the coast with the Warlocks and the Grateful Dead and Pigpen and all that, and and uh, I I thought Cassidy's comments were really good because he said all of a sudden all these rock fans in the Bay Area who never had heard that other side of music were now being presented bluegrass with the the biggest rocker in the area, Jerry Garcia, playing five string banjo. And Cassidy said it was really a big, refreshing break, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I was in the middle of it, and I didn't know, you know, how big a part it was of anything, you know. I was just trying to play music, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you've made it, you've talked about it a couple of times, uh, transitions. Uh, like, you know, as I've interviewed more and more cats, it's just, I get caught up in a certain period, but then you guys bring you back because inevitably that chapter closes and something else move. You just move on. Life changes. You say people from the caves, they saw you go through different changes. I mean, can you talk about your own personal experience, how you deal with these changes, not specifically what they were, but how they affected you? Well, I started to study Buddhism while I was at sea train. In fact, uh, my, one of my, one of my last parts of my touring was then with, was in Scotland, and I went to a place called Samye Ling, which was a Tibetan Buddhist center. Kind of, at, we played Liverpool, and I took the train up to Scotland. And I had been studying under a tutor uh, the writings of Aristotle as a sacred tradition, not Aristotle as just a you know logician, but what was behind Aristotle's whole school was the fact that. 
the mind could become illuminated with gnosis, with knowledge of its own self, uh, sufficient uh, energy and light. And so Tibetan Buddhism was presented in that course as Amir mentioned that that was one of the last societies to have the whole society pretty much based on this idea of gnosis, of illumination of the mind. And of course, that's what the 60s were about. Was we were all, Everyone was awakening to, reawakening to something that they knew was rightfully theirs, their tradition to become enlightened. You know, and it took many different forms and the drugs both obscured and kind of opened things. So I had to, uh, if the, my first contact with anything Tibetan was on the final sea train tour was, you know, up in Scotland. I went to Sami Ling and uh, I had an embarrassing sort of interview with the, with the Lama there. And But, you know, pat on the back, like, you know, keep at it, you know. <laughs> And, right. but, but I think it was the drugs that really made you want to have some system of thought that where the mind could not trip out, but the, where the mind could follow, you know, kind of like re-nourish itself in mm. its own juices and, and kind of uh, re-inspire you on its own. So although for years I still smoked a little pot, at one point in my studies of Buddhism, I, um, a Tibetan Lama friend of mine said, you know, if close students adulterate their mind with anything, it can really make the teacher sick. And that really changed it for me. It was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I don't think I, I don't know if I believe that or not. <laughs> well, no, it's true because, you know, in, in the... No, in, I, in I, the, I take it very seriously. I take what in, you're saying very seriously. In, but, the, yeah. in, in the relationship, it depends who your teacher is. In the relationship with that teacher, the teacher's going it, to, it's more experienced than you, and it's going to show you things that you, and help you, often in a rough way, you know, you know, often in a way that's going to make you confront your own ego in a way that's not comfortable. And, uh, and it's a risk for the teacher to become you know, follow through with the intention to become more and more helpful and more and more involved with the student. And then you find, now this is like, almost like in deep relationships of all kinds, you know, you find that the energy of, of somebody has extended to you to a point where you're, you're using that energy. So if you adulterate your own constituents of your body and your speech and your mind, that could muddy the water and also mm. m muddy the connection with the teacher. That's what that means. Um, mm. In other words, so because if all beings are interconnected, you know, is a student-teacher relationship not exempt from that? No, that's the interrelation with people. That's what you're learning. In this Buddhism, you know, compassion for all beings, you're learning the interrelationship with beings, karma. You know, even though we think we're learning Hey man, I feel so inspired, dude. Hey man, dig this. So what we're gonna do is get a hundred thousand people, man, and we're gonna go to the pyramid, man, and we're gonna raise the pyramid. You know, that's not what it's about. That's all mental phenomena, you know. Mm. So if wow. if what we're le if what we're learning on the level what they call the Mahayana, the wide path, if what we're learning is karma and compassion. And then working towards learning wisdom, which is the emptiness of all phenomena. What what more interrelated relationship is there going to be than the student teacher relationship? It's an example, you know. It's an example of all all that that we're trying to learn as as a society is interrelatedness, you know. Then the 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 levels beyond that, you know, you, you kind of have to pass that test. You can't really go beyond until that, that part of the, that's called the Mahayana. I would say that's the greater part of the path, you know. The, the beginning is the, the urge to become enlightened, and, and then you learn to be enlightened for others. What does that mean? Mahayana. 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 The great path, the wow. great way. So, you know, how long is that pa part of the path going to take somebody? There are some people who go, got it, I'm going on a three-year retreat, and they're, they become, you know, Young llamas, you know, Westerners, anybody. Let me ask you though, uh, so that this you had this, um, you know, um, experience with the with the llama patted you on the back. But how 
did Buddhism take you through a transit that was a major transition for you? And yeah, your, you well, know. you know, I think part of the path is learning what it is, what the path is. You know, I had the intention. Your path is, yeah. uh, well, or that path, yeah. But w- the path that I was beginning to, I had read, you know, and and they describe the six perfections of the mind and how. These are the natural qualities of the mind, generosity, effort, uh, concentration, patience, you know, all these, these what we, you can call them virtues, you know, but they're really the qualities of the mind on its own. And But if we don't know those qualities, then we have to practice each part of it. And it, if you perfect one of these perfections, you've perfected them all. You can see it that way. If you, if you perfect effort, then everything else is there patience intention right mm-hmm. if you in, if you perfect patience then the rest is there the rest follows as part of it it's just like the interrelatedness of the mind's qualities we label them as separate things but it's really one thing and at the end of the path that that, that one thing is the you know all inclusive expansiveness of compassion and the wisdom which is referred to as the 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 vast emptiness of of phenomena, so that that's freedom. So this is what kind of kept me going through. I always knew there was some other thing that I wanted music to reflect, and it was also my survival mechanism. You know, I didn't start taking hard drugs and stuff. I began to clean up and clean up and try and try and no. But I have a lot of karma. I've got a lot of interrelatedness with lots of beings, and uh, it took a while to kind of see how that could be a skill in itself. You know, like Jerry had that. He had a complete, huge interrelatedness with many, many, many people, thousands, maybe millions of people. Mm. But he couldn't find a way to be responsible for it himself. All he could do was put out the energy that he knew he had. You know what I mean? And he, he was not ignorant of of these philosophical ideas either, you know. He, but he chose, I don't know how you describe it, he chose <laughs> humor and, and. well, I would say if Jerry was suckered in by anything, it was nihilism, that nothing really did matter. Nothing matter, yeah, yeah, belief in nothing. The, well, the belief that ultimately the emptiness of all things is just a big nothing, that, so it doesn't really matter, you know. It's yeah. not that he didn't have a good heart, but I think that's that can sucker you in pretty deep. It did for me for years mm. and years and years. And then the other side is eternalism, which is kind of like Puritanism, you know, where everything must be this way all the time, you know. So the, between those two things, we chose nihilism. We chose the sort of cosmic party over the solemn... <laughs> You know, solemn. You know, uh, you know. Thing. Yes, I know exactly. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. You know, uh, we got a piece of music. Uh, why don't we cue it up and then we'll come back and talk about it.
sort of somewhat polished pop pop rendition of Midnight. You know, but the the drummer, I think it was Russ Kunkel, he got it right. Russ it, is it, oh. that that rhythm that I play on the guitar, you know, but I did it didn't do that. That is a that really is more of a New Orleans bass beat than a country beat or Mexican or anything. And I've I've actually gone back to playing it that way. Uh, so Russ got it right when he had that little shuffle going on there. He, okay, he, so that's he, he got oh, it that's right. cool. And that, this David Hayes on the bass. David played with Van Morrison for years. David was huge. I mean, he's yeah, very modern with Jeff Labis. Uh, the the so David Hayes on bass. And then your can you talk about your? You know, we've had a, I've been able to spend a decent amount of time with with Peter driving in the car the last day or so, but. Um, can you just talk about your your relationship with your brothers musically, and then um, uh, you know if there's still more work that that you'd like to to do with them? Well, with my brothers, Chris and Lauren, you know, I was the older brother. I was the one who went out into the world and brought the music back, turned them on to stuff, and then they were of the generation of the Beatles, and uh, whereas my generation was the Buddy Holly kind of thing. So I had a different kind of take on it but we did stuff together quite a lot we sang a lot together we sang a lot of country songs together because bluegrass has this wonderful potential for harmony and I wanted to mention Joseph Valiente when I was you know 16 years old Joe Val was playing bluegrass around Boston at the Hillbilly Ranch with the Lilly Brothers with he had his own band he was with Jim Rooney and Bill Keith and Joe Valiente used to come out to my house we'd go pick him up in Waltham he was a typewriter repairman and he he taught me how to hear the harmonies of the Leuven brothers, the Blue Sky Boys, and all that stuff. That changed my direction, you know. And so the Rowan brothers being a trio, we we still explored all that kind of stuff out of the bluegrass world where, you know, parts switch and jump around and move around, and we've always used those ideas. But the... the, the the problem was that I always had to be the leader, but I also had to be the brother that allowed everybody to be equally expressive uh, in a situation where a wiser approach may have been to say, you'll get your turn. Let's just do it this way for a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the hardest thing is to be the leader of your own brothers. You know, they, <laughs> they're not going to really want to go along with it. But in saying that, I've heard some music over the past year or so that has re-inspired me in a way, and it's it's very, uh, as I say, you know, Hawaiian music is a lot of the origins of what became country music, and I've been listening to some historic recordings of Hawaiian music, and by gosh, it is the most stirring, beautiful music. It's a combination of Christian hymns and native Hawaiian music and whatever they're picking up from the States, like uh -huh. ragtime or or jazz or pop at the time, you know, back in the early 20s and stuff like that. Oh, the Hawaiian Islands, I remember leaving there a few years ago after being on, on tour with the David Nelson Band. I just looked around and I said, there's mis there's more music here than I've ever experienced in one place, ever. Wow. I'm not hearing it, but I hear it in the air. And I, I had to leave, and I had my guitar, and I was getting on the plane. I said, but I am coming back. I don't know why or how if it's going to happen. And after a couple of false starts where I tried to involve the brothers immediately in a project of Hawaiian music, I've kind of hunkered down with some Hawaiian players and explored a few things there and, and the whole idea of the guitar as a slack key, you know, different tunings. I mean, I'll never be a, a Hawaiian singer, but, you know, my earliest musical experience was, was my Uncle Jim in in when I was like four years old, 1946, my Uncle Jim came back from New Caledonia where he'd been stationed. And he brought back all these coconut bras and grass skirts. And he made us dress up in the living room, my weird Uncle Jim. Uh, and had my mother dressed up and she putting on a coconut bra and a grass skirt. I had a little grass skirt, you know, and <laughs> I looked down there and there's my, there's my little something poking through the grass. And I was like... Well, this is weird clothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, uh, and then Uncle Jimmy, I mean, there's photographs of this. Uncle Jimmy in his sailor hat and, and grass skirt with a ukulele he'd won in a poker game leading us in some Hawaiian song like I want to go back to my little grass shack in Hanalukalu, Hawaii. 
I learned from Uncle Jimmy because he was the first guy I ever saw play an instrument. And I learned on a baritone ukulele. Uh, and I learned Bye Bye Blackbird, Ain't She Sweet, and Five Foot Two. And uh, for a kid of eight years old to learn these songs was like, it's so liberating, you know. And, and there was no rock and roll un- until we were four years later, you know. My dad gave me an Arthur Godfrey plastic ukulele and I used to listen under the covers to Arthur Godfrey's show from the beach at Waikiki. And this was before he had his talent show in the States. It was post-World War II live radio from Hawaii because that's where they went to party. Red Skelton still is talked about as the most partying guy that they've ever seen. And Red Skelton had a club there, and Gabby Pahanui and all those people used to play at his club. Jerry Bird from Nashville went there, for, and for years learned and reinvigorated the whole Hawaiian steel guitar tradition. And so right now, for me, I see, I see a way where voices can be used in, a li- in not quite the high lonesome sound, but the, <laughs> uh, you know, not that hard-edged bluegrass thing at all, but more of a just a, 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 a warm and gentle Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that. It's just that uh, that old-time Hawaiian stuff is just like listening to some radio barn dance from the 30s. You know, it, there's a spirit in it, you know? Mm. And now modern Hawaiian music has got this you know, tremendous use of vocals, and like um, studio techniques, modern techniques that's bringing out the best of it. And I listen to it, and I go, you know, that's what the Rowan Brothers were always all about, even that tune Midnight Moonlight we just heard. That's all acoustic guitars, you know. It's just the drums are leading everything. That's the way it is, you know. The drums are leading. That makes it pop music. In Hawaiian music, the guitars lead. And, you know, th- that leaves, uh, that uh, 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 opens some room for vocalization that's not based on, you know, uh, it's not based on pop tradition of American music uh, per se. Although Hawaiian music has absorbed everything, so I I think there's a way to do a kind of acoustic album and and, and get the voices of the Rowan Brothers all together again, mm-hmm. but it can't be something where the it has to be more relaxed than. Maybe I should sing the high part. I think that's probably what it was because that's what Bill Monroe did. You know, I'd sing the lead in the choruses, but I'm um, on the verses. But come to the chorus, Bill would be on the high part. And if he sang the verses of a song, he'd be in the high part on the chorus. You know, he, it was, that's a big tradition, you know, that the lead voice jumps up to the highest part and creates a continuity that way instead of like a linear way of thinking that the lead voice has to sing the, the lead vocal on the, on sure, the chorus. Sure, You know, that, that creates something that I've not done before, which is just to keep my voice tying it all together all the way through instead of making room and letting everything else fall in around it, you know. And when I play bluegrass, I, I do sing the lead all the way through. And I've got great, great singers in the band, Chris Henry and, and, and Keith Little, and they, they know where to go with the vocals. But the, the Rowan Brothers, you know, it, it, everybody always asks, what's the, the, as if the, there is this potential there, as if we're already famous, and <laughs> when are you going to make another great album? It's like, our albums didn't sell anything, but people know us. No, well, I mean, that's the point, is that, that, that they're, like we talked about in the car, mm. There are, who knows how many people are out there today. We can't figure, it's a supply and demand issue. But back then, there were identities through, through I mean, through mediums of records. So the, mm-hmm. the pictures are there. Your liner notes, mm-hmm. in some cases, are there. So people will say, well, these cats are still alive. I mean, they're, they're family. They must be doing something. Well, to, to, to say what I'd like to do with the Rowans is not just show up and jam and sing our old songs, which we do once in a while. But... To take responsibility finally and say, no, this is what we're doing. <laughs> we're not going to be doing those songs. We're going to be doing at least these new songs with a new approach. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I'm hearing it now. I'm hearing it. Because, I mean, that's part of my legacy in this life, you know. I've, I've, I've pulled the bluegrass thing around full circle, you know. I, I've got a bluegrass band and we're making great music. And then there's always that ghost of the Rowan brothers going, well, what about us, <laughs> you know? So I think there's a way, maybe not a full album project or something like that, but some way to highlight what is beautiful about those voices in a new way. That would be my goal. 
Did you ever did you ever play any music with uh, the the actor Steve Martin? No, no, I've been. He's done a few gigs where we've been playing on the show. He's pretty funny. He's banjo cat. He plays banjo. Yeah. Oh, he's. Yeah. He's he's been uh, the Steve Canyon Rangers have been his backup band, and, and now he's working banjo into pop music and all kinds of stuff. What about um? There was one guy I wanted to ask you about. Speaking of vocal harmonies, I figured C Train probably maybe went on tour with the with the band. Did you ever, did you ever meet? Did you ever get a chance to know Levon Helm at all? Very slightly. We were very aware of each other because we C Train used to open the shows. We were all uh, handled by Albert Grossman Company, and uh, we we play. Oh, we had great gigs. Central Park. Oh, it was super man. Couple of three years running, and. Uh, I was smoking. Oh uh, yeah, I, I I remember there was an article in Rolling Stone that said that it was a review of a concert we did somewhere, and during the band set I was just off stage, just listening, and um, the writer noticed that, and he he mentioned that I was there just soaking up everything that those guys did. I mean they they had gone back to a such a straightforward approach, you know, and it allowed for a lot to happen. But then you read the biography. Whew, what a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but you, Levin, yeah. Levin really, I can see why Levin felt that he was the center of the the thing. And it, he was a little bit defensive about it because he saw the whole thing fall apart. Yeah, he was the guy who lived in the South. and he's, That's where that music came from. And the Canadian boys picked it up through Ronnie Hawkins. And Ronnie used to Levon went with Ronnie before the, any of the other ones did, and it was a very good biography. Of, of, this wheels on fire, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, but there was, uh, um, and then I think if I remember correctly, Richard Richard Green would tell me that when I think Mahavishnu Orchestra, you went up with with them as well. He used to sit behind Billy Cobham's drums, and I'm just thinking to myself, my God, C Train and Mahavishnu Orchestra. Just I mean that that concept in itself is so refreshing. I mean you're just going to take you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's just music. You know, it, it's not so. It's not just soul, rock, jazz. It's not all segregated. You oh know? no, we're trying to. I was trying to absorb everything. You know, well, you were able to. I mean, like he just said, he would sit behind Billy's drum kit and watch him. I mean, I guess that was the point. Is that there was a the idea of um, uh, you know being as good a thief as you could, the learning, learning, the learning. And then, and then, I mean, these were our teachers, and you know, we I'd left school and. I wasn't going to be halfway about it. Uh, you know, there's different ways it can all come together. You can sort of cop a style and say, this is my reggae style album. Or but you can do a solo thing where all of those elements come in, and that's where I'm headed, is trying to, like, do a solo project that that honors all those elements, you know. And uh, But drummers, a whole different thing. I was always into the drums. Uh, it was probably the first thing I played was drums. And uh, like Jamie Oldacre... Eric Clapton, strummer from years ago, played on Lay Down Sally. He's been recording with me. He's playing with me. He's coming out to the West Coast to play some more. It's like, I, I appreciate the drummers because their whole thing is like, they've got to fit into everything and yet make everything sound great. Mm. We've got to make everybody sound good. <laughs> and he's the first guy in the business that ever told me that I was the guitar player. And I said, I'm, I'm a rhythm player. He goes, no, no. Fire those other guys. <laughs> You're the guitar player. Wow. I mean, I'm a little old to be <laughs> a, a lead guitar hotshot, but <laughs> that's about the responsibility that I've avoided all these years, you know? It's like, yeah, you know more than you're letting on because you're, you want to be shy. And because the conflict between my parents made me a, like a neutral guy. You could become very wishy-washy trying to please mom and dad, mm. you know? And I think that's plagued me, you know. And musically, the best thing I've ever did was a solo album because that I didn't have to do anything but what I could do. And, you know, you can hear the banjo in there. You can hear all the stuff in there, but it's just me playing guitar. So, I, you know, I mean, by my age, I should be happily retired and rich man in a mansion somewhere, uh, according to the, the myth of increasing wealth in America. But it's not so, <laughs> and uh, no. so I mean, I, yeah, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep the juices going as long as I can, but with better judgment about how to spend my time, I think it'd be the key. 
how much do your juices get flowing when you when you're able to play a, a local gig and, and riff with Ramblin' Jack Elliott once in a while? Unforgettable nights. To be. Can you talk about because I that's what I crave is the is the is the old uh, you know your your like you said it yesterday very glibly to your girlfriend but I can't remember exactly the words you just it's an enclave of the uh, of the you know the radicals you know that you're all congregating in I, I mean I interviewed Ramblin' Jack right there in that mm. chair there and he was talking about his boat and uh, then you said that where you were living and I think I was like I think that's where Ramblin' Jack's living and sure enough you guys have been playing some gigs together yeah we live. <laughs> We live in this obscure California area called Tamales Bay, uh, and on it's bordered by the National Seashore, Point Reyes National Seashore. I live in a cabin out there, and Jack lives across the bay in in the little harbor of, in Marshall. And uh, he's got a boat, and um, everything with Jack is epic because it's it's a part of a story, a part of a narrative that he keeps telling. And it, and it, I'm just so glad you got a lot of it on tape because you know the narrative, and the storytelling is is really the kind of. That's the secret part, you know. And uh, we, for too many years, we've been conditioned to kind of play music over the roar of the crowd and, you know, conquer them with our music. And although it's never seen that way, it, it tends to get that way. But Jack is from the old school where. There's no talking. You're going to listen to this guy breathe, and he's going to say some things. And that gives the performer a chance to improvise in a deeper way because the, you, you stop being pressured. I mean, Jack is not above just saying, hey, you people talking out there, you got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Crowd control. Right, right. And, 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 and in that... In that restaurant setting, he must have to do that once in a while, I bet. No. The thing, the good thing about what we're doing out there, on way out on the West Coast, watching that fog bank come a little closer <laughs> Sounds so great. You have no day. idea. I, I crave <laughs> fog. I, I, all we see is sun. I mean, I love it. It keeps me going. But, I mean, that to me is surreal. Continue, please. Yeah. Oh, I, one time I swam in the Indian Ocean on the south coast of uh, Australia, and I could see the South Pole fog bank. It was like hundreds of miles away, but it was so tall. Wow. You know, it was like seeing the Himalayas, you know, from Nepal. They're 400 miles away, but they're huge. <laughs> you can see them. Anyway, the fog bank kind of keeps us all neighborly in the wintertime. And, 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 and occasionally, you know, there'll just be a spontaneous uh, performance at, at a local restaurant, a place called the Station House Cafe. And my bass player from my bluegrass band, Paul Knight, puts on these weekly things. And it's great because there's so many blues players, for instance, in the Bay Area that you wouldn't even be aware of. And he'll call them up and they'll come over to do a Blue Monday. And it's the real deal. These people are devoted. They've been, Their whole adult life has been to, you know, play the blues. And uh, one guy plays, and he's a terrific guy, uh, he can play harmonica. But his brothers in the Thunderbirds, in the fabulous mm -hmm. Thunderbirds down in Texas with Jimmy Vaughn. And here's the other brother who, can I go on the road? Can I go with you guys? You know, I mean, he's not the star, but he brings his own beautiful approach to it, you know, and the little restaurant place, everybody's going to eat. And, and it may not be full that night in the bar, or it may be like, yeah, this is magic, you know, and that's what we, what we wait for is just for the magic to happen. Very casual. I mean, it is not like a magic is waiting no, to no, happen. No, no, <laughs> I, I dig the, 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 the intimate. That's when I talk about the idea of being able to see cats like yourself in this kind of intimate setting. And now I think you were very articulate. There has been like a, uh, you know, a nonverbal message to musicians to conquer the crowd yeah. via noise. Well, it's gotten louder and yeah. noisier, but not necessarily that there's no stories attached well, to that. Well, the story, where where the stories really take place and the band thing is together is New Orleans. Because you engage the people with music that makes them want to dance. And that's the only reason that I like to play in a like a dr drum and bass setting out there at the restaurant. It's not suitable for a solo sort of performance. It's an interactive thing. 
you know, bluegrassers or, but, you know, there's a wonderful local drummer, Michael Pinkham, who's just got great control and great sense of groove. Calls, and Paul plays the bass, and uh, Pete Sears sometimes plays piano, or Lonnie Levenger, Banana, plays the piano. Uh, I love it. I play guitar, I play electric guitar. The thing is that there's no script, so I might just start a groove based on how I feel the the mood of the bodies of the in the room and pretty soon the room's dancing you know what I mean? so you've conquered there's no the, the band and, and the audience are they're one thing and that's that's what New Orleans brings to it is is their music is how do you bring the people into this moment you know it's not like play over their heads blow them out although that's happening there too because of the college kids drinking and all this stuff but the real, the real old-time groovy music that's drum and bass uh, and horns and electric is like everybody lays back and lets that groove just bring you in. And, you, and it's joy. It's just joy, you know. So that, that vibe happens out there, for me anyway, you know. I, I enjoy ad-libbing songs, making up songs that just have a good groove to them. I was hoping, uh, just as we wrap up part two here with Peter Rowan, uh, d- I, maybe Ozzy Ollers can come down to one of those those jam sessions. <laughs> I think I just, Ozzy's moved to L.A. or something. Uh, I don't know what I, I thought. I don't. I thought Ozzy was in the Bay. I just know he. You guys collaborated. He was that played on your albums. Ozzy's been on a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. But that also ties into another recluse. We're talking about some of these guys that never were as they weren't open like the beat guys, but a guy Robert Hunter. Did, did, I mean, you you hung with Garcia, but Hunter is uh, in that same vein of, I mean, he's 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 just he doesn't want to be seen. Well, I've studied his work a little bit, and uh, yeah, I don't have his ear, but we've we have hung out. We've been on the road together. Uh, Jim Lauderdale did some collaboration with him. Dylan did too. I'm sure if we wanted to, we could collaborate. But I think philosophically, philosophically, maybe we ha- we're we're in the same place. Mm-hmm. We could, but you know, how much would you really learn from each other? Maybe, or or, or should we, or would we? Or, yeah, you know, it's a great idea, but and the idea will live forever. <laughs> Our collaboration that will never happen. Well, I just I want to say, uh, you know, I I really am honored that you um, you have come down here to to perform, and uh, I just thank you for all your years of creation before I was ever conceived after and just sort of your ability to to try to um, to create sound messages of love in mm. your music and mm. that and Thank that you. that's all that matters I mean it, it's uh, you know that's all you can do uh, you know mm. as we go you create that that Dharma you know and you and and you lead that existence and I'm learning that now. And trying to trust in that, you know, mm-hmm. in, the, in my mid thirties. But mm-hmm. what you have said about, um, I think that's just the coolest thing is that you know you you deify somebody. My generation deified Olden in the way, for instance. You mm-hmm. look at the cats in that group, and you begin to look at them as somehow they're big. They just have everything. They know something more than other people. They are in some sort of tr- state. But then, as you listen to my, as I listen to these interviews with yourself and David and any of these other cats, mm-hmm. you realize that you're just, you guys were just growing up, struggling to find your yeah. voice, struggling to find, and that to me has been emboldening because most people sit in that bubble and just say, well, they either they're resentful of it or they just they they deify, and I know that that's something that bothered Jerry a lot too. It was just it was just he kind of gave up because it was like he didn't he wasn't a god and he didn't want to mm-hmm. be treated like one, and I think you're like the same way, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, one thing is over the years I hear this music olden in the way, and uh, you know, at one point it's like, wow, we were together, you know, because a lot of the self criticism of the band was it's just not up to snuff, or it's funky, it's groovy. You can't judge loose music if it hangs together; it's hanging together in the, and you can't define it. You know, it's it's a vibe, um, and then later on. I'll hear that music again, and I'll go, my gosh, you know what I'm getting now is a message that for a while we really trusted each other, you know, that we trusted 
Then music is about trusting the other players, you know. So there's lots of different levels of of goodness about it all. Yeah. I'd like to just say something directly to Robert Hunter and his man. I've been reading your stuff and my appreciation is deeper than ever. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Rowan. It was an honor. Pleasure, Jake. This is the Jake Byberg Show, and we'll see you all in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>